Um, hello and good afternoon, good morning and good evening, depending on where you are joining us from today. My name is Mara Tsarka and I'm a research associate and project events manager at the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the fourth session of the VCDNP's Deterrence and Emerging Technology, or DET, webinar series. The DET series is a collection of six webinars that are to be held every Wednesday at the same time through the 3rd of November. We founded the DET series to explore the impact of emerging and disruptive technologies on the stability of deterrence, as well as the opportunities these technologies could offer for arms control and confidence building measures. Today, we'll be discussing the changing battlefield landscape through the development of artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities for military purposes. Last week, we started the artificial intelligence discussion, examining the potential risks of introducing AI into decision-making and weapon systems, as well as possible pathways to mitigating those risks. Today, we will further the discussion on artificial intelligence on the battlefield. The rapid introduction of computers into war fighting tools, such as drones that could carry high explosive warheads or driverless tanks, as well as the increasingly compressed decision-making time that come with this technological advancement have thrust humankind towards a situation where governments and militaries around the world may risk losing control over both lethal and non-lethal arms. With this daunting prospect, this webinar will discuss the need for legal and ethical norms, both formal and informal, both international and domestic, that could help prevent the loss of human control over artificial intelligence tools that could be used for war and in deterrence relationships. Our speakers, whom I will introduce in just a moment, will consider paths towards building legal and ethical norms that help enhance predictability and prevent the breakdown of deterrence as a result of the exclusion of humans from command and control chains. Before I introduce our panelists, however, I would like to go over a few housekeeping announcements. First, please note that the webinar will be recorded and the recording of the webinar along with the write-up will be posted on the VCDNP website at www.vcdnp.org in the coming days. We'll also be live tweeting about the event, so do follow us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at VCDNP. During the Q&A portion, those of you who are joining us via Zoom, we kindly ask that you submit your questions using the Q&A function that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Please do not submit your questions using the chat. And for those that are joining the live stream on YouTube, if you have questions to our panelists, please email them to events at vcdnp.org. Now, without further ado, I am pleased to present our panelists in the order in which they will be speaking. We'll start with Ambassador Thomas Heinosi who is an Austrian career diplomat and has worked extensively on nonproliferation and, and disarmament issues. He has served in various posts abroad, including in New York and Geneva, and is the former director for disarmament, arms control, and nonproliferation at the Federal Ministry for European and International Affairs of the Republic of Austria, as well as the former chair of the missile technology control regime. Dr. Frank Sauer is a long-term observer and participant in the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, CCW process in Geneva, as well as the wider debate on weapon autonomy. Dr. Sauer is a member of the International Committee for Robot Arms Control, the International Panel on the Regulation of Autonomous Weapons, and the Expert Advisory Group on the Responsible Use of the Future Combat Air System, which is Europe's biggest defense program. Laura Brun is a research assistant in the Emerging Military Technologies team at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. She focuses on emerging technologies from an international humanitarian law lens, which will also be the focus of her remarks today. Prior to joining CIPRI, her work focused on the protection of civilians in remote warfare, not notably by analyzing and tracking reported civilian harm resulting from airstrikes in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. Now, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to pass the virtual micro microphone to our first speaker, Ambassador Thomas Heinosi. The floor is yours. Thank you so much and uh, welcome to all participants. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the VCDNP 
for organizing the deterrence and emerging technology series. I think it is very interesting, but also very timely. And hopefully it will raise more awareness for the impact of new and emerging technologies on disarmament, arms control, and non-proliferation, but also on international law, in particular international humanitarian law and on ethics. The international community has elaborated binding documents on the civilian use of artificial intelligence in fora like the EU, the Council of Europe, and UNESCO. But when it comes to the military use, we are lagging far behind. To my knowledge, the only forum where the international community is discussing the application of new and emerging technologies on weapons and warfare is the so-called group of governmental experts on lethal autonomous weapon systems, the GGE laws, and I will come back uh, uh, to it later and explain more what it is. Its mandate, however, is limited to only one part of the wide spectrum of the relevant challenges that AI, machine learning, and new and emerging technologies in general pose when used in weapon systems. The increasing application of such technologies will ultimately impact many current forms of weapons and warfare. Traditional weapons might be augmented or integrated into a weapon system. Indeed, focus on those issues is lacking today, and we might speculate why this is so. A possible reason could be that states that have embarked on using artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other relevant new and emerging technologies for weapons are not interested in the consideration by the international community in order to keep their options wide open. But in the rule-based international order, there are legal and ethical boundaries that have to be respected. The choice of means of warfare is not unlimited. It is international law, which is the yardstick for what kind of weapons can be developed and used. With increasing levels of autonomy of weapon systems, the question of legality of a weapon per se deserves particular attention. During the development of new means of warfare, states must ensure that any potential weapon would per se be capable to be used in respect of international law and its basic principles such as distinction, proportionality, and precautions in attack. And I will explain them later. If a weapon is by its mere design not compatible with international law, it must not be developed. International law recognizes the concept of weapons that are indiscriminate by nature due to their unacceptable humanitarian harm, and thus they must not be developed. When exploring the limits of the acceptable, the question of possible lawful use of a certain weapon system is another key consideration. It is noteworthy that lethality per se is not a concept in international humanitarian law. The same reasoning is valid for autonomy, but it is a question of the level of autonomy. It is important to consider the key challenges autonomous weapon systems without meaningful human control over critical functions would pose to international humanitarian law. Critical functions of a weapon systems are in particular the selection and the engagement of a target. So the decision which target and when to use force. International humanitarian law Compliance is highly context dependent, which is particularly sensitive when it comes to emerging technologies with autonomy in critical functions. Any use of a new weapon needs to comply inter alia with the three fundamental principles under international humanitarian law, namely the principle of distinction, proportionality, and precaution in attack. Distinction means that attacks may only be directed against combatants and military objectives, never against civilians or civilian objectives. Algorithms uh, are unable to know whether a combatant has surrendered or is order combat. 
Proportionality means damage expected to civilians must not be excessive in relation to the military advantage anticipated. A pre-programmed originally legitimate target might, for example, move to a market and only human control during the execution of the strike could stop that such a disproportionate attack killing many civilians at the market and not only the target would occur. Precaution in attack requires persons who plan, decide on and carry out attacks to do a number of complex risk assessments like choosing means of attack that avoid or minimize incidental loss of civilian life or injury. The compliance with these three fundamental principles under international humanitarian law necessitates human judgment and has to be seen in a contextual manner in light of concrete circumstances. And circumstances on the battlefield are of an evolving nature that can change rather quickly. Human control of a weapon and human judgment are necessary prerequisites for accurate assessments. Machine learning brings unpredictability as humans do not know how the results are produced and whether they are correct. The so-called black box phenomenon, when it concerns autonomous weapon systems, humans do not choose or know the specific target and the precise timing and or location of the application of force. The wider the range of targets and areas and the longer the duration, the higher the unpredictability and probability of indiscriminate attacks, as well as other violations of international humanitarian law. It would be extremely problematic if the black box leads to situations where the human cannot predict the actions of a system, not only from a perspective of international humanitarian law, but also from a security perspective, as this would effectively mean losing control over the use of force. A major question is what and how much of the elements can be delegated to machines. Certainly not responsibility and accountability. These are intrinsically human qualifications and central figures in legal thinking. How could the engineer, programmer or commander be held accountable when the autonomous weapon system selects the concrete target by machine learning and its attack cannot be stopped? In addition to profound legal concerns, there is the ethical dimension. Should sensors, software and machine processes substitute human decisions about life and death? Most will agree that an algorithm should not decide over who lives and who dies. In the words of the UN Secretary General, and I quote him, machines with the power and discretion to take lives without human involvement are politically unacceptable, morally repugnant, and should be prohibited by international law." End of quotation. The loss of moral responsibility and human control would result in the loss of human dignity of the victim, but also of those who ordered the attack. This contributes to the dehumanization of warfare. Only human deliberation can lead to responsible decision-making. Taking human control out of the process removes the possibility for compassion and restraint, human qualities that have saved millions of lives in warfare. Technical efficiency-driven autonomous weapon systems might instead seek to simply maximize the number of killed enemy combatants and not stop by themselves. Data bias poses both an ethical challenge as well as a reason why machine learning has a tendency to multiply inaccuracies and irreliability. Diluting the concept of accountability from one weapon user to a higher number of involved persons from the designing engineer over the programmer to the commander leads to an erosion of moral responsibility in decision-making 
on the use of force. While there are many good arguments that autonomous weapon systems, which can kill human beings, run counter to international humanitarian law, there's no unanimity on the issue in the international community as can be observed in the proceedings of the GGE law. The ethical dimension has a bearing on international humanitarian law. This was formulated already in 1907 in the famous Martin's Clause, and I quote it, in cases not included in the regulations adopted by them, the inhabitants and the belligerents remain under the protection and the rule of the principles of the law of nations as the result from the usages established among civilized peoples, from the laws of humanity and the dictates of public conscience." Unquote. When international humanitarian law was formulated beyond its principles, the idea that machines could kill human beings without human control over selecting and executing the target was unthinkable. Therefore, no relevant provisions exist. Yet it is clear that the addresses of legal norms are human beings and not machines. The question is whether additional international humanitarian um, law norms are required for autonomous weapon systems. <coughs> Sorry. Even for discussions in what has become the a group of governmental experts uh, on these autonomous weapon systems are now going on for seven years. No consensus has evolved. This body uh, uh, is under the convention of certain convention and weapons and is working on the basis of consensus. And uh, this convention on certain conventional weapons um, is aiming at prohibiting uh, superfluous suffering uh, and uh, uh, violations against uh, humanity, what we have seen, for example, with uh, uh, interpersonal minds. Only the lowest common denominator uh, can be adopted when you work on the basis of consensus. And there are 125 states parties, so it's, it's not global because there are more than 190 states, but still a very high number. And uh, uh, they are meeting uh, in Geneva uh, various uh, times during the year, uh, but they are still only discussing. Uh, they have produced something, which are the certain guiding principles. And um, of course, again, uh, not unexpectedly, they are of a very general nature. But the work undertaken so far has also shown that there are considerable differences on how individual states interpret international humanitarian law when it comes to autonomous weapon systems. Also the weapons reviews that are obligatory under Article 36 of Additional Protocol 1 of the Geneva Conventions are neither transparent nor undertaken in conformity with non-existing common standards. Um, so basically, uh, this Article 36 means that when you develop a new weapon, uh, you have uh, uh, to go through a process checking whether it's conformity with international humanitarian law, uh, both uh, for the development, for the nature of the weapon, and then secondly, also for the use. And as long as you uh, are not transparent about this, uh, what kind of criteria you use, uh, um, it's, it, it's very hard uh, to come to an international standard. And uh, also the results remain with the country that is uh, doing this weapon review. For those reasons, particular legal norms for autonomous weapon systems are needed. So far, not even a mandate for negotiations has been seriously discussed. Austria, Brazil, and Chile have tabled a proposal to start negotiations on an additional protocol uh, to this uh, convention on uh, certain uh, conventional weapons already in 2018. In December, so in a couple of weeks, uh, the review conference of this convention has to consider 
the still not prepared report of the GGE laws and take a decision. In view of the rapid technological developments, a continuation of a mere discussion format would not make sense. A clear regulation is needed before autonomous weapon systems killing people without meaningful human control over critical assumption uh, can be deployed. And with the rapid technological progress, we are coming, of course, closer and closer to this moment. Such preventive action is urgent and possible as the prohibition uh, of blinding laser um, has shown, which has become protocol four of this convention. Clearly, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other new and emerging technologies can be used in all sectors to the benefit of mankind. And also in the military one, uh, just think of improving verification. But when a machine would select a human target and kill it without meaningful human control, then a red line would be crossed, contravening both human dignity and international law. The destabilizing implications for international security would be far reaching, triggering more, very likely a new arms race, a change in modern warfare bringing less restraint because the lives of own soldiers would not be at risk, and new perspectives also for a privatization of war that would induce terrorist groups to try to get hold of these weapons. My final thought is uh, that not everything that is becoming technically possible should be allowed. The clock is ticking. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Haino C for giving a broad overview of the situation and a very powerful message at the end. I'll now turn to our second speaker, Dr. Frank Sauer. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is a fantastic webinar series. And I'm extremely pleased to be on a panel with such distinguished co-panelists. Now, the organizers were kind enough to provide me with four guiding questions. I find that very refreshing. And I'm more, happy to, uh, more than happy to address them and structure my remarks accordingly. So without any further ado, here's question number one. Is it possible to exclude humans from the well, yes and no. Um, no, because this question could be interpreted as meaning that humans no longer participate in or concern themselves with war fighting at all. And this quickly takes you to this notion of a robot war, a clean war fought by machines without human suffering and casualties. And I think this is at best wishful thinking. It paints an absurd picture of what war is and means, and it gives rise to unrealistic expectations about the possibility of a bloodless war. War is between humans, it's politics, but with other means, as Clausewitz famously stated. It's the clash of human wills and interests. Death, destruction, and suffering is an intrinsic part of war, always on at least one side. Machines don't have wills or interests or politics. But if we were to ever end up in a situation, hypothetically speaking, in which machines on all sides Fight, fight our wars for us as proxies in a virtual war, so to speak, like the Robot Wars TV show with no human suffering, then I suppose that rather than having two ginormous robot armies destroy each other to determine the victor, it would be much, much cheaper to just play a game of chess or soccer instead. <laughs> the other more serious answer to this question is yes, because that is what we've been observing over the last two decades in which many militaries around the globe have started to engage in efforts to replace labor with capital or humans with machines, if you will. The reasons for this can be sought in changing demographics, in the general post-heroism in many OECD societies, in hopes for cost effectiveness, and last but not least, in an increase in military effectiveness. Remotely operated unmanned vehicles, not only the drones in the sky, but also a range of systems uh, of various shapes and sizes, on land, on the high seas, underwater, and so on and so forth, have served this exact purpose. They have taken human soldiers out of harm's way. Which takes us to question number two. 
in which scenarios or contingencies may that become desirable? Well, it's the long list of dirty, dull, and dangerous tasks in war. And having machines do those things is not necessarily a bad thing, of course. Even though there are unintended side effects of shifting the costs of war away from humans, especially in democratic societies, in which this can result in a lower threshold to armed conflict, but this is not our concern here today. We are here to talk about AI on the battlefield and autonomy in weapon systems. And thus the real question is why remotely operated weapons, which, as I said, already take their operators out of harm's way, do not suffice. If, say, a drone pilot is completely removed from the battlefield, 6,000 miles away, then why take the next step and lend autonomy to the system for it to no longer require a human operator at all, rendering the constant communication and control link obsolete? One reason is that this enables the weapon system to continue its operation where a remotely piloted system couldn't, for instance, in environments where communication is degraded or denied. But more importantly, weapon autonomy means that the invariable delay between a remote human operator's command and the system's response is removed. This results in much swifter reaction times, generating a key tactical advantage over a remotely controlled and thus necessarily slower adversarial system. I would argue that the promise of gaining the upper hand by allowing for the completion of the targeting cycle at machine speed is the most important push factor behind current efforts to make weapons autonomous and remove humans from the targeting loop entirely. And with that, we are talking about weapons which select and engage targets without human intervention and the question of meaningful human control and how it can be retained. In other words, we have arrived at question number three. Can humans control drones and robots, including and especially swarms? Okay, so here let me say first that a swarm is not a swarm. There's different ways of conceiving of swarms and most importantly, a couple of uninhabited systems doing something in formation is strictly speaking, not a swarm. A true swarm with emerging capabilities, you know, modeled after the schools of fish or flocks of birds we find in nature can indeed only be realized by handing the direct control of each individual unit from the human operator over to the machines. But the swarm as an entity itself, its goals and even its individual actions can of course still be remotely supervised and determined by a human operator. So meaningful human control, and we've already heard this term from the ambassador, meaningful human control must not be confused with direct control, as in a human constantly supervising and remotely controlling a system. That would be remote control. That's not what meaningful human control means. Instead, the exertion of human control over a weapon system should be conceived of being the opera operationalization of control both by design and in use. Okay, now what does that mean? Control by design means that the system has to be set up in a way that allows a human operator to gain enough situational awareness to make the required legal and ethical judgments during the system's operation. In other words, the possibility of exerting human control has to be baked into the system so that its performance can always, always reliably be traced back to human agency. Control in use, in addition to that, means that the human operator should be able to foresee the weapon's effects on the battlefield, especially when targets are selected and engaged, and ad administer its operation in a manner that is compliant with the laws and norms of war. Clearly then, and the ambassador touched upon this briefly, operational context is key. There is no one size fits all meaningful human control. The human-machine interaction needs to be adjusted in a differentiated manner. Who or what, human or machine, is deciding what is always dependent on the where and when of the engagement and, most importantly, on which kind of target is being engaged. This means that when defending against material, such as incoming munitions, the weapon's critical functions can be performed autonomously without human participation if the machine is set up with spatial and temporal limits appropriate to the operational context. It also means that selecting and engaging targets in a cluttered environment at points in time 
uh, where it's Im impossible or hard to ascertain in advance um, when force is used, then this requires much greater human involvement in the sense of human judgment and agency in the threefold sense of foreseeing, administering, and tracing. In such a case, humans have to decide what, when, and where to engage, particularly when an application of military force could endanger human life. And with this, we've arrived at the final question, question number four. How reliable are communication links that connect humans and command centers with drones or robots or whatever it is on the battlefield? Let me begin my answer to this question with continuing my current train of thought and exemplifying what I've just stated in terms of context-dependent human control. Take the combat direction system of a Navy frigate, for example. If designed to only fire at incoming anti-ship missiles and if operating without human intervention only for brief periods of time, whilst in the uncluttered environment of the high seas, such a system can, even if that may seem somewhat counterintuitive, be considered as being under meaningful human control in design and use. Okay, even though it performs the critical functions of target selection and engagement autonomously. But we've already established that meaningful human control is not remote operation. In other words, a human constantly connected to and controlling such a system is not necessarily required for it to be under meaningful human control. After all, what I just described, this Navy frigate, is already a reality in many navies around the world, and there's no need to change anything about that. In sharp contrast, however, a gun turret with automated target recognition capabilities designed to accelerate the targeting process of a robotic tank operating in an urban environment, this would require every single shell to be triggered by a human with sufficient situation awareness for an informed decision to be considered under human control especially because of the remaining shortfalls and brittleness of the AI-enabled object recognition that would almost certainly be used in such a system. Okay, so now I've said in the very beginning that one of the drivers behind the increase of autonomy in weapon systems is the continu continuation of missions in environments with degraded or denied communications. Requiring human control in the use of a system with autonomous targeting capabilities thus is somewhat of a conflicting goal. And this is, I suppose, where question number, few, number four is, is headed and why the organizers are asking this. And I am frankly not qualified to definitely, definitively judge if a reliable communication link to say this robotic tank I used in my example can be kept up at all times. Not having a technical background, I only suspect that it might be feasible because there certainly are clever ways of daisy chaining directional radio or communication lasers connections. What I as a political scientist can say for sure, however, is that the ethical, legal and pol political risks of not retaining meaningful human control over weapon systems will outweigh their military benefits. And finally, in my mind, the development of technology and the development of law are going hand in hand. After all, we're obviously not judging the use of a modern loitering munition by the same standards that were used for carpet bombing in World War II. If technology increases capabilities and opportunities, then the obligation to use this technology to satisfy key criteria of international humanitarian law, and the ambassador just introduced them to us, discrimination, proportionality, and precautions in attack. The obligation to satisfy those increases by an equal measure. Uh, but I'm saying this not being a lawyer, and that's why I'll stop here, because the next speaker is much more qualified to speak to this. And so I thank you for your attention at this point, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Sauer, and thank you for fully embracing the questions that we as the organizers posed um, and giving such very full and detailed responses to those questions as well. You've already led the introduction to our third and final speaker of of today's session, and that is Ms. Laura Brun, to discuss more about the IHL argument, the International Humanitarian Law Discussion. So over to you. Thank you so much, Mara. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, again, also thank you for inviting me to this uh, interesting seminar. Um, yes, I'm, I'm delighted to be part of today's discussion and to share some of the secrets finding with you. And um, yeah, I'm, I think the more light we can shed on this important topic, the better. 
Um, so I will try to um, take over where Dr. Sauer left and um, and hopefully, I mean, as the third speaker, there will maybe be a bit of repetition, um, but I will hopefully my presentation, we will be able to, to build on some of the elements that uh, my co-panelists have already laid out. Um, and <clears throat> I also brought some slides with me. So allow me to share my screen with you. Um, one second. So I hope you can all see my screen now. I can see people oh, nodding. Yes. So, yes, we can see it perfectly. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, so uh, my presentation today will focus on how to ensure compliance with IHL when introducing AI to the battlefield. Um, so, and my presentation will not prejudge whether AI poses more concerns than benefits to compliance with the law, but rather it will try to clarify some of the legal issues arising from using AI in the battlefield. Um, it is uncontested that, of course, AI on the battlefield should comply with international law, including um, international humanitarian law. But the question how IHL applies remains unclear and rather debated. A central element of the debate is the question of what IHL requires from humans and permits from machines. Today, I will argue that IHL does not provide clear answers to this question um, and that further clarification is needed notably in order to build norms around uh, how lawful use of AI should look like. Um, in CIPRI, our research has found that clarity is needed around what IHL says with regards to who must do what, when and where in order to exercise and implement obligations under IHL. That's just a quick recap of my key message. Um, but today my presentation will be centered around three elements. First, I'll briefly go through the key principles of IHL and what limits IHL places and the means and methods of warfare, AI included. Second, I will address the potential challenges that AI poses to compliance with, AI, uh, with IHL. And third and finally, I will suggest how legal challenges raised by AI may be addressed and further clarified. Quickly, uh, before we begin, a note on the concepts. What are we actually referring to when talking about AI on the battlefield? I mean, it's, it's a really broad concept. Uh, AI in the battlefield can come in many shapes and forms, spanning from non-lethal capabilities uh, used to scan, collect, and analyze data, uh, and also in critical functions known as weaponized AI used in the application of force. Uh, in my inter intervention and in my work in CIPRI, uh, when referring to AI on the battlefield, we are referring to the, to the latter. So when AI is used as a part of an autonomous weapon systems, um, despite a lack of commonly agreed definition, we understand autonomous weapon systems, like many others, and also just laid out by my co-panelists, as weapons that once activated can identify and select targets and apply force without human intervention. Uh, while autonomous weapon systems are not synonymous with AI, nor the other way around, the technologies are interconnected and the legal issues they present are to a large extent similar. They're both expected to transform, not replace human decision-making in warfare, and they thereby touch upon fundamental questions about what the law requires from humans and permits from machines in life and death decisions. So with that, uh, let's jump to the first part of the presentation, uh, quickly outlining, outlining key principles of IGL. And again, I will do it brief also because the ambassador just touched upon these principles as well. Uh, but the overarching aim of IHL is to, uh, to limit the effect of armed conflict and to balance military necessity with humanitarian concerns. IHL is a body of rules that sets out restrictions and prohibitions that must be complied with in international conflict, whether they are international, international or non-international. Many of the provisions laid down in IHL treaties are also reflected as, as general principles of international law and in customary international law and in IHL and are thereby binding for all parties to an armed conflict. As you'll see in the slides there, I shall broadly speaking limit the means and methods of warfare in two ways. First, it sets out general and specific rules limiting the types of means and methods that can even be introduced to the battlefield. So that is weapons that are unlawful in their very nature. For example, if they are of a nature to cause superfluous injury or unnecessary suffering, they would be unlawful per se. Secondly, IHL sets out limits on the ways lawful means and methods can be used lawfully on the, on the battlefield. And this set of rules also known as the rules guiding the conduct of facilities. 
Among the most essential, essential and famous principles are the principles of distinction, uh, proportionality and precautions, um, which we just heard what um, are about. But in a nutshell, it's about, they lay out the rules um, about need to distinguish between military and civilian objects and persons to ensure potential harm does not exceed the military advantage expected. And finally, that parties to an armed conflict take constant care to the civilian populations and take all feasible precautions to do so. A common interpretation is that compliance with these principles demand contextual value judgments. So whether AI capabilities are categorized as a mean or method of warfare, they will need to be used in compliance with these principles. Um, in addition, um, our research has found that securing a respect for IHL presupposes a fulfillment of three conditions, which Dr. Sauer also just touched upon. These conditions are not explicit requirements of IHL, but some we have identified through a systematic review and assessment of the relevant rules of IHL. The first condition is the ability to reliably foresee whether the operation and effect of a system and attack will contravene the rules of IHL. This is important at various points in time um, in the targeting cycle. Um, so the, the ability to foresee the effects is uh, essential um, at the very early stages when doing a legal review, for example, which we can come back to later if, if there's time, uh, but also at the very moment of, of attack just before activation, it's important that users can foresee the likely effects in order to make legal assessments under IHL. Second, IHL compliance presupposes the ability to administer the operation in a manner that is consistent with the rules uh, governing the conduct of facilities. Finally, the third condition we identified is the ability to trace an operation and effects of a system back to relevant human agents. This is a practical rather than a legal requirement, but tracing back conduct is essential in order to attribute responsibility to individuals and or agents of the state in case of a violation of IGO. So based on that overview, we can jump to a, an overview of the potential challenges to compliance with IGO that may be posed by AI. So <clears throat> it is uncontested that IHL applies to humans and not machines. However, AI raised some unique challenges in terms of how humans exercise and respect the obligations under IHL. When using AI on the battlefield, decisions to use force and the pertaining assessments under IHL may be made longer time in advance and with a greater geographical distance between the decision maker and the application of force. A key issue with autonomous weapon systems, for instance, is that they're triggered by the environment, which means that once activating the systems, the users do not necessarily know when, where, or against what force will be applied, which may pose quite significant challenges to compliance with rules that arguably rely on contextual assessments. Specifically, we can look at how AI may challenge the ability to foresee, administer, and trace back conduct. So first, the use of AI, like already mentioned, is associated with higher degrees of unpredictability. This is because the behavior of AI systems depend on a number of, of non-static factors, such as the amount and quality of the data input, the environment of use, self-learning capabilities, and how the systems interact with each other and the environment of use. This element of unpredictability may raise novel challenges to the ability to reliably foresee and assess whether effects will be lawful or not. Likewise, the ability to administer the system may be challenged too by AI. Due to the time lag between activation of the systems and the application of force, it may be more challenging, if not possible, imp impossible to sufficiently administer the system during use. For example, will the users be, still be able to suspend or cancel an attack if needed? In relation to the ability to, to trace back, AI poses the challenge that is being captured as a black box concern. This refers to the issue that users only see and understand input and output, but not the process and workings between the two. This lack of explainability may challenge the ability to trace back conduct to a responsible agent. Likewise, the use of autonomous weapon systems um, is, for example, likely to include a complex web of people involved in the decision making, while tracing back conduct to a responsible individual may be difficult, if not impossible. So as technologies are likely to play a bigger role on the battlefield, 
and norms need to be established guiding the rules. The big question is now how IHL compliance is secured between human and machines through the interaction. This is a critical question that I cannot give you the answer to, but um, I will try to give you a quick overview of the key legal questions that needs to be addressed. Um, so now we're actually getting to the heart of the debate, namely what IHL requires from humans and permits from machines in decisions to use force. While we see that IHL is quite clear about effects, it, like attacks may not cause superfluous um, harm or unnecessary suffering, IHL is on the other hand, a bit more unclear about the process. So how are these effects produced? Um, and this unclarity is brought to the surface by AI, posing questions with regards to what extent tasks may be delegated to machine processes. With this question in mind, we sat down in CPRI and reviewed the relevant rules of IHL. We found that IHL is not clear on the question of the process. And as a result of that unclarity, states have very different views uh, on what tasks in decisions to use force should remain with humans and which can be delegated to machines. Roughly speaking, it's a complicated uh, discussion, but roughly speaking, you can divide views into two camps. You, the first camp would argue that IHL is solely an effect-based regime, meaning that it permits militaries to use pretty much any combinations of machines and humans, as long as anticipated effects are lawful. From this standpoint, human involvement in the exercise of distinction and proportionality assessments is nothing but a practical response to technological limitations that may be overcome in the future. Meanwhile, we have a second camp that would argue that IHL is a process-based regime, meaning that the entire process leading to the application of force needs to reflect human agency and intention. From that standpoint, implementation of, of obligations under IHL, such as principles of distinction and functionality, demand human judgment, regardless of how good technology becomes. All right, so with that in mind, uh, I'll move to my last slide. In order to build norms around lawful use of AI in the battlefield, clarification of what the law requires from humans and permits from machines is needed. In the context of autonomous weapon systems, it is agreed that human machine interaction is highly context dependent. However, context dependency does not mean that legal requirements cannot be specified. In our work, we identified a way to reach more clarity. Notably, we found it would be useful to address what IHL compliance demand across four dimensions, a personal, material, temporal, and geographical. The personal dimension relates to who and how many may or must respect IHL provisions. Again, there is a consensus that it is humans, not machines, who are the responsible legal agents. But the question is how, who and how many involved in this complex decision-making process may be held responsible. The material dimension relates to what type and degree of human machine interaction the rules of IHL require, permit, or prohibit. For instance, to what extent can IHL mandated evaluations be delegated partly or fully to machine processes? The temporal and geographical dimensions relates to when and in relation to what locations IHL provisions need to be complied with. For example, how far back in time and how fine space may IHL mandated evaluations be made? In addition, in addition, we can throw in a critical fifth uh, dimension or question relating to how the lack of force stability introduced by AI should be addressed and managed. How should unpredictability be evalu evaluated in advance, controlled during employment, and assessed afterwards? So to summarize, addressing who should do what, where, when, and how when using AI on the battlefield will help clar clarifying under what circumstances tasks may be delegated to machines and when they should remain with humans, and thereby clarify what it takes to ensure compliance with IHL as well as ensuring human responsibility when introducing or if introducing AI to the battlefield. So um, that concludes my presentation. Uh, I hope it provided with a good overview of the legal uh, challenges that may be raised by AI and how further clarification may be generated. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you so much. And I look forward to your questions. And I will stop sharing my screen. Okay. Thank you very much for diving a bit further into international humanitarian law, as well as giving us some food for thought for the type of questions that the legal arguments are facing right now in the context of international humanitarian law. 
We are going to open the floor now for questions, just as a reminder to our audience. Um, those of you who are joining us via Zoom, please submit your questions using the Q&A function, which you can find at the bottom of your screen, as opposed to in the chat. And those of you who are joining us via the YouTube live stream, please submit your questions to events at vcdnp.org. Now, before we jump to the questions that our audiences have posed, and while they're being filtered into the Q&A, I do have a question that I would like to ask all three of our speakers, and that's the issue of accountability. All of you have touched up, touched on the issue of accountability in one way or another, noting that accountability is a bit diluted because you have numerous chains and numerous actors. Also in the last slide that Laura just presented, the issue of accountability, who and how many could be held accountable under international humanitarian law. So I was hoping that each of our speakers um, could touch up on this issue of accountability when we talk about legal and ethical norms and the use of AI on the battlefield. Who and what can be held accountable and how would that process go about in your opinions? So I am going to um, start with in reverse order. <laughs> so Laura, we'll give the floor back to you and then go to our other two speakers. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for that question. Um, the issue of responsibility and accountability is indeed one of the major, major questions in this um, debate and also one that's pretty much sparked uh, the international discussions around uh, whether or how to regulate autonomous weapon systems uh, the, with the famous reference to this responsibility gap uh, that is being feared. Um, I mean, it's it's a it's an important question, and it's um, one that has been touched upon a lot. But still, it's clear that further legal clarity is needed. Um, we can take one example. For instance, um, in it's um, often being referred to or suggested that we should be able to hold designers and programmers, developers responsible. Uh, which is also why we ask the question of how far back in time can you trace responsibility? Can you, in fact, uh, hold a developer accountable or responsible who, who whose action or whose conduct took place maybe a year before the actual application of force. These are some legal questions that need to be addressed, um, especially in terms if it's if we talk about individual responsibility in contrast to state responsibility, these are two different uh, legal regimes. But when we talk about individual responsibility, a key element is the notion of intent. There has to be a mental element. Um, this means that uh, the user or the responsible individual is aware of the consequences. Um, this is quite interesting and, and difficult in relation to um, unpredictable uh, weapon systems. So we need to be sure that the, in order to hold uh, individuals account to demonstrate that they had the, they could establish or satisfy this mental element that they knew about the possible uh, effects. Um, so again, this is not a question that I have the answer to, but this is something that needs to be addressed uh, in order to clarify how in, in the different um, responsibility framework should be uh, in, applied when using AI on the battlefield. Thank you for further elaborating on that. Dr. Sauer, would you like to contribute to this question? Sure, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to use this opportunity and, and you know, give credit where credit is due. If you, if you listen carefully to what I was saying and then what Laura was saying, you'll find that a couple of things sounded exactly the same. For instance, this notion that the human element is tasked to, to foresee, to administer and to make traceable. And then this notion about the who, what, when and where. Uh, the reason is that I always you know, make sure that I read all the CIPRI reports. So most of this is basically Laura and her colleagues at CIPRI who are doing a terrific job at moving the debate, you know, along. And I think there's, you know, as someone who's been in Geneva from the get-go, there was a lot of confusion at the beginning. And I think we've come a very long way and there's a lot of convergence in terms of how do we even speak about this issue. And um, so CIPRI definitely, definitely and, and, and the International Panel on the Regulation of Autonomous Weapons, for instance, where I'm a part of, um, Many, many uh, of those advisory bodies have, I think, done very valuable work to, you know, clear up some of the confusion. And now about the accountability and the responsibility. I look at this basically as the entire debate to me, there, there are three levers and the accountability lever is just one. Um, 
there's an there, there's an ethical component to all of this. There's there's a legal component and there's a strategic component. And the legal component is of course very important because we're in this the CCW in Geneva, this forum, the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. It's an IHL framework convention, so everything, to put it simply, has to make sense in an IHL frame. And here, of course, accountability and Laura has just you know explained this perfectly better than I could is is very important. But so is responsibility in terms of ethics. You know, this was uh, uh, the ambassador spoke very clearly to this, and I agree fully with everything that he's saying. I think algor algorithms should not be making life and death decisions on the battlefield. I think we're reducing human beings to objects, and this just should not be done. But I'm also fully aware that you know this is my German point of view on this, and this is deontological ethics, and there's a whole lot of Immanuel Kant in there. And not everyone, you know, thinks about these things this way. And so this, that's why it's important to know that it's not only accountability and law and responsibility and ethics, there's also immense strategic risk connected to handing over the entire targeting cycle from humans to machines. Because machines will not only fight at machine speed, they will also make errors at machine speed. And we might just not be able to pump the brakes on what is then happening and we would we might see escalations that no one intended maybe some sort of war happening by accident and so there's all kinds of different reasons strategic ethical and legal and different levers to pull uh, to move this debate forward and to get some sort of regulation in place and our accountability certainly is very important now within the CCW framework, but it's very important not to forget about all the, the other aspects that are also, you know, very prevalent in this debate. Thank you for expanding on that. Ambassador Hainosi, would you also like to say a few words on this issue? Um, you're currently muted, so just un perfect. I can be rather short because I fully concur with the two other speakers. Uh, I think our legal uh, system is built on the concept of accountability and then, of course, responsibility. And uh, uh, so uh, this is a key tenet uh, uh, to, has to do with causality, causality and other things. And uh, uh, somebody, and that, that somebody means a human being has to uh, uh, be accountable and machines cannot be accountable and, and, and that's a very clear uh, 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 side of the discussion uh, uh, in a legal system you cannot condemn a machine it doesn't work uh, so uh, therefore uh, I think on this point there is already uh, agreement uh, uh, that uh, uh, accountability um, has to be there uh, and, and it means that humans have to stand uh, for, for the facts. And then the problem starts, of course, as has been pointed out, because uh, uh, who has to take the responsibility? Uh, uh, it, it's impossible as long as uh, uh, autonomous weapon systems uh, decide certain things by themselves. So, so how can we blame the programmer? Uh, not even, I, I think, uh, the commander who doesn't know exactly what will happen. And uh, that means we would get into a kind of lawless space, uh, which is certainly very unsatisfying. And uh, if we would do this, uh, in other realms uh, of um, our world, it, it would be very strange. So I think there are good reasons why, for example, uh, in the medical field, uh, yes, you, 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 you can use uh, artificial intelligence, but uh, nothing would be done without human control. Uh, and that's the key tenet here. A human has to be there to control, and that doesn't mean every little step, just as Frank has said, uh, but you cannot take uh, a human out of the equation. Thank you. 
Thank you very much to all of our speakers for addressing that question. As we talk about this human machine interaction, quite a few questions have come in from our participants regarding this relationship. One of our participants is curious if anyone would like to elaborate on how AI generated decisions are less human than human decisions. And in that regard, um, someone asked, building on this accountability argument that is an accountability primarily related to the state of knowledge of the decision. So if humans are in the loop, I'm assuming, then humans can maybe be accountable even if the machine is the one selecting the target. Um, so maybe if any of you would like to touch just on this dynamic of how are AI generated decisions less human than human decisions? And on that spectrum, how does this feed into the accountability argument. I think a lot of you have already touched on that a bit, but um, if anyone wants to expand, I see Dr. Sauer, you've already unmuted, so I'd be happy to give you the floor first. Thanks. Um, I think I would first of all say that AI is not in a strict sense even capable of making decisions. Uh, be it, you know, good old fashioned AI with decision trees, decision trees, or, or machine learning, I would not necessarily call this a decision the same way a human is making a decision. It's not saying that humans are you know, always great and that we're perfect and that we're making correct decisions all the time. We're, we're not. Probably most of um, you know, the people on this call will have heard about you know, thinking slow and fast and Daniel Kahneman and all these cognitive biases that we suffer from. But still, there seems to be a weird tendency to um, remove the human brain, which is a phenomenal cognitive um, machine that has evolved over many years and that can do fantastic things quite well to um, prematurely, in my mind, remove it from the equation. Look at what AI is capable today. It is either doing quite meaningless things. I mean, okay, it can probably vacuum your floors and if the, the vacuum you know, hits the wall, it's not really a, a big problem or when used in tasks that are outside of the very, very narrow set of its training, for instance, if we're talking a machine learning system or tasks that are you know, really hard and, and include something like value judgments, it fails, it can't do any of this. So I think in, in, in a way, the question is really skewed because, skewed because it, there seems to be the assumption that AI is kind of there. It's not there. It can't do anything a human can do, uh, let alone in, in a war fighting situation. So it, is, it seems to me you know, quite obvious that the answer is not to um, say no to technology and you know, move back in time or something like that. We should embrace technology. And I think it should have been uh, clear from my remarks, the, the military will and can adopt uh, artificial intelligence on the battlefield and is already doing so. And there's nothing necessarily problematic about that. But clearly, um, you know, the best way to go about this is to, you know, um, balance the strengths and weaknesses of humans and machines and find a good way to, you know, have this human machine interaction play out in a way that um, it works within the ethical and legal and political framework works that we deem, you know, appropriate. And so that would be my answer to this question. Um, I'd really, you know, put a big damper on the AI hype, especially when we're talking using it, you know, in a military context where the application of force is concerned. Thank you very much for taking up that question. Do either of our other speakers want to add anything? No. Okay. Um, given that this question was raised, and thank you for um, the detailed answer, Dr. Sauer, one of our listeners would like to further learn more about the types of autonomous weapon systems that already exist and which have been used in military conflicts. So I think since we're right on this topic, if, if anyone would like to provide a few examples of the types of systems that already are out there and what has been used, that would be really useful. Um, does anyone want to go first? Yeah, Laura? Um, I can just quickly um, jump in here. Um, so, I mean, it's, um, it's a popular phrase to say that autonomous weapon systems are, are already here, um, which they are to some extent, but again, there's um, also 
sometimes on clarity what types are there and what are not. Uh, but um, what is currently being used and has been used for quite some time are autonomous weapon systems for defense purposes. Um, for example, um, you have the Iron Dome, um, that is an example of an autonomous defense systems, um, anti-missile system. Um, like you'll also have um, the use of swarms you've already seen in use in some cases. Um, the reason why I'm hesitating is also that you will have heard recent uh, headlines about um, um, alleged use of AI or autonomous weapon systems used in, in, in the context of an armed conflict in Libya. You will have, perhaps have heard about uh, the killing of an Iranian scientist by um, an Iranian missile, missile um, allegedly using AI capabilities. Um, so while we have some um, known current defense systems in use, um, the, 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 the scope of the use is still, um, it's a popular topic, but it's still a bit unclear to what extent and for what purposes AI is being used, uh, especially when we talk about the critical functions in the application of force. Um, that's where uh, it's it's less clear. Um, I, yeah, but um, that's just my immediate reaction to that question. Thank you. Thank you. Any other immediate reactions from our other speakers? Yes, Ambassador Heinosi. Yeah, well, of course, that's the $1 billion question because when you listen to the discussions in the GGE laws, uh, uh, everyone is speaking about future possible and at the same time of course we know that there are many uh, projects underway uh, in this field and uh, all these uh, developments are very secret uh, uh, so they, they wouldn't be announced and uh, uh, certainly I think it's a very narrow line because uh, you can uh, take out human control of certain systems, possibly, and uh, then it might uh, switch to uh, fully autonomous uh, 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 functioning. And, uh, and certainly, uh, what Laura just has said, for sure, I mean, there are the, all these uh, anti-missile uh, uh, systems uh, uh, that uh, are already fully autonomous for quite a number of years. and. Uh, uh, that's uh, something uh, uh, that quite a number of countries have already, uh, but uh, they're destroying missiles, they're not killing people. So, so that uh, the, uh, some people argue that they're actually Iron Dome, as an example, protecting uh, uh, people. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there were instances uh, already in the Iraq war, when a system, uh, anti uh, uh, aircraft system, uh, uh, was switched into a uh, more autonomous uh, mode, uh, a British plane uh, was shot down by a US uh, weapons platform, which shows also uh, how dangerous things can get, because the moment there's a misidentification what is coming in. Of course, uh, uh, you cannot uh, stop it easily. Uh, so what we know for sure is uh, that uh, uh, developments are underway. It's a burning issue. And uh, what our objective, of course, would be is uh, to have a regulation before these things are uh, on the battlefield. And I think it would also be in the interest of those countries that have relevant uh, programs running uh, to find a common uh, uh, limitation, uh, because if not, where does it end? And uh, they themselves, are of course, uh, obvious uh, targets for such attacks and could be affected. Uh, so I always think uh, it would be good if we would uh, find a kind of consensus where this red line goes as early as possible. And of course, it, it should be in, in legal uh, form, but what we have seen with other relevant uh, 
treaties such as the Interpersonal Environment Treaty, that those are those countries that do not ratify the treaty. Almost all of them, um, uh, they uh, follow uh, the rules. And uh, therefore, it's necessary that we have clear legal rules here. And uh, I think Laura has uh, uh, spoken on this uh, very persuasively. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sauer, did you want to add anything? Yeah, just to really drive home this point, I think it is extremely helpful in terms of avoiding continued confusion about the, the issue to not conceive of what we're talking about as a category of weapon systems. There is not a category of weapon systems and those are the autonomous ones. And then there are all the others that, and they are the non-autonomous ones. This is simply not how it works. It is, it is um, much more productive to conceive of it as autonomy in weapon systems, which is a spectrum, which has existed for decades. So it's not new and it's not necessarily problematic. As we've seen, you know, you can fire at incoming missiles, and we've done this for 30, 40 years autonomously, selecting and engaging targets without human intervention. You know, the machine is doing it. You don't even need AI for this. We've been doing it since the 80s, and it's that that's fine. What we're now seeing is that AI, of course, is an enabling technology, and so this former niche capability of machine selecting and engaging targets is now becoming much more widespread. And that's why we need to be concerned about it. That's why we need to address it and, and find regulation for it. But it is very much not a class of weapons, but more the uh, reconfiguration of human machine interaction in war, what we're talking about. But it is really hard for many people to wrap their heads around. And even you know, in Geneva, it took years for most of, of, um, of the people in the room to wrap their heads around this. Thank you. I think that's a really important distinction to make. And so thank you very much for um, kind of making that very, very strong point, because it's true. I think often in the entanglement of these discussions, sometimes um, it is misclassified as an actual weapon system as opposed to a technology that's aiding systems. We've, we've already talked about um, something needs to be done. And one of our Participants has asked exactly that question. So what kind of steps should we take now to prepare for the future, noting that legal processes are always a bit slow, including the international humanitarian law processes. So where should our priorities be now and what steps should we take um, to prepare for the future? I am happy to give the floor perhaps to Ambassador Hainosi first. Thank you. Yeah, indeed, that's always the, the problem that we face that certain processes are uh, very slow. And uh, I think uh, uh, part of the problem is, of course, as long as you work on the basis of consensus, how can you expect rapid progress? Uh, so that uh, there's certainly an issue uh, there. Uh, I think uh, it is uh, today much clearer than uh, two, three years ago that there's a real problem here. And uh, I want also to, to, to thank the ICRC and civil society, especially of course, killer robots for their work, because I mean, the first step is always awareness raising. As long as people do not know about the problem, why? should they be interested and when there's no public interest there's not a lot of of pressure on government uh, so this work uh, is irreplaceable and important and uh, uh, then I, in my recollection i think uh, the common denominator how we look uh, at those issues has grown which is good which is uh, the result of the GGE uh, laws. But what we need now urgently is, of course, a regulation. And this cannot wait uh, forever. So we will uh, have to start negotiations. Uh, and if it is blocked in the CCW, it will be, as always, uh, in another forum outside, because it's a real issue. And uh, uh, so it's up to those states who on one hand say it should be considered in the CCW framework and that the 
the same time uh, they block it. They, they are not willing to take the next step, which are of course negotiations. So uh, this uh, drama will be played out now in December. And then of course, uh, uh, everyone will, will take stock, but the problem doesn't fade away when we just say, oh, we can discuss this uh, for years. Uh, because uh, we have to act and we, we have to act uh, very quickly. So I'm quite interested how these things will now go on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Sauer or Laura, do, do you have any thoughts on next steps for the future? Yes, Laura. <laughs> um, just quickly, I can just add um, to what the ambassador just said that indeed in December it will be a critical uh, time to, to a critical juncture uh, for the future process, uh, whether it will stay within the CCW or continue outside. But just one quick observation from my side is that it's quite interesting to observe the debate, how the, at one hand, you have the this sense of emergency or, or, or urgency. That there's a, time is limited. We need to react now. Techn technology does not wait. Um, we hear that from one side, which is also the side calling for the need to, to negotiate um, possibly some, some new regulations and new rules. While you, on the other hand, have a, have some states who would say that exactly because of time, we don't know yet, we do like the technologies are still so new, it's premature to assess and regulate. Um, so it's also always the dilemma with like how how preemptive you should be. Um, and this is also, I think, why the, the process is, is so slow, uh, because states fundamentally disagree, maybe, or perceive the challenges very differently in terms of when we should act preventively or when we should, or when we act too, too rushed uh, and thereby limit possible uh, opportunities to, to, um, to use uh, the benefits of, of these technologies. So it's just an observation how the temporal thing is, is quite um, funny to you know, It really divides people um, in terms of when to act um, and how long, how long to wait. Um, yeah. No, thank you for sharing that observation. I see Dr. Sauer, you've just unmuted yourself. Did you want to say something on this question as well? Yes, please. <laughs> two footnotes, uh, two footnotes. Um, so Laura was mentioning this notion that um, nothing should be prematurely regulated because we're not sure yet where the technology is headed. I think this is pretty much a red herring at this point because I mean, even in, in this call, we've established that the key really to regulation is looking at what in, in GGE parlance is called the human element. So kind of what we were saying, what is the human supposed to still be doing and when? And frankly, the details of the technology that is driving the weapon systems doesn't don't matter at all doesn't matter if it's good old-fashioned ai or machine learning or if you somehow build a, an autonomous weapon system from sticks and stones it's really just crucial the crucial question that needs to be answered is what's the human doing what do we want humans to still be doing in war fighting and so there's not really a need to wait for how technology plays out i think this is in some ways also a tactic to you know keep dragging your heels um and you know the, just and, and and another you know point in that regard is that you can also of course have a sunset clause on something like this you could say this is what how we're going to do it for the next five years and you know if the singularity happens and you know ai does phenomenal phenomenal things all of a sudden then we can reevaluate. there's nothing stopping the international community to do stuff like this and uh nothing stopping the international community is footnote number two um the, the CCW in Geneva, the GGE, the CC, or this, the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, which would be the body within the UN in Geneva, which would uh, create some sort of legal instrument, what they call a protocol, is a consensus body, but um, it doesn't have to be. So it has just been agreed upon to operate in this framework by consensus There's no need to necessarily be doing this. So states parties in Geneva could just move to a um, majority principle. My colleague Elvira Rosat has written on this and they could keep the ball rolling, no problems. 
But as long as only one of the hundred and what it is, what is it, 140 states, as, as long as they're one state vetoing, nothing gets done. And it doesn't have to be like that. It's just been chosen by the states parties until now, at least, to operate the CCW in this manner. Just maybe some food for thought um, in that regard. Thank you. Speaking of the CCW, there have been some specific questions about the current process with regard to the CCW that I'd like to pose to our speakers. Um, one is within the CCW debate, there's the notion that responsibility and accountability should be ensured through a human responsible chain of command and control. How does the attribution of responsibility work through the command and control chain, chain when referring to emerging technologies? And the other question that specifically has been posed with regard to the CCW process is with regard to lethal lethality. I've just lost my question, so there we go, there it is. Um, can you please refer to the lethality as a criteria in the lethal autonomous weapons debate in the CCW? When did this first appear and what role does it play in the discussions? So with both of these specific questions about the current CCW process, I'm happy to give the floor to whomever would like to offer some clarity to our audience. Ambassador if you want, I can take the lethality issue. Uh, it's in the mandate of the GGE. It's not ours, but laws uh, that dates back. There are many delegations, uh, like for example, uh, the Austrian one, uh, who think it would be much better uh, that we drop the L because lethality is not a legal concept. It's the result, you know, only afterwards whether somebody died or not. Uh, uh, so therefore, I also spoke always about autonomous weapons uh, systems. Uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, you can say uh, that's a finesse because um, the real problem is, of course, uh, that uh, uh, machines would kill uh, human beings without human control, to put it in a very simplistic uh, way. Uh, uh, so uh, whether you drop the L or, or not, uh, I think the problem is obvious. Uh, 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 it's a deep ethic. Uh, ethical problem, but, but also on the IHL, uh, it simply, uh, as I see it, it it's, it's not permissible. Uh, so, so much for, for, for whether we have the L or not. I prefer without the L, but as long as it is, as it is in the mandate, uh, it is there and we will see whether there will be a consensus on any new mandate because uh, uh, and that might be a minor issue in those negotiations, whether the L is there or not. Thank you. Thank you for taking up that question. Um, Laura or Dr. Sauer, do you either want to add to that or would you like to address the question on human responsible chain of command and control? Um, I can add a notion on the second question about Perfect. human command and control. Um, so that is, um, I, um, where to start? It's, it's a really good question. Um, and it's one that is at the core of the debate. It's being referred to uh, all the time, also reflected in, in um, the GDE's previous reports um, as something that needs to be maintained, a responsible human command and control uh, chain. Uh, the question is exactly how or, why, or yeah, how this is um, ensured. Um, when using autonomous weapon systems. And one of the key questions here is, of course, that it comes back to how many tasks can be delegated to machines um, in order to for humans to still be responsible. Um, and at each level in the decision-making progress uh, across the life cycle of the autonomous weapon systems, who individuals make what decisions um, and how can a potential violation of IHL be traced back to a specific conduct across that uh, decision-making tree. Um, so I think uh, this needs to be further elaborated and 
potentially states could share how they how the current mechanisms work, for instance, how do they currently trace back responsibility, um, what mechanisms are in place or what mechanisms should be in place when introducing autonomous weapon systems to, to the battlefield. Um, it, um, and that's hopefully uh, something that uh, the future will be able to, we can look more at, into in the future. Uh, but it's indeed uh, an, an important question um, and the heart of the debate actually, uh, as, I, as I see it. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sauer, was there anything you would like to add? Yeah, I, I fully agree. I mean, just to give um, uh, you know the listeners an overview, the way it is currently being discussed, um, this is not uh, by any means you know agreed upon. But it it is this is the a, an important strand of the debate is that there might be regulation that follows a two pronged approach. So you have obligations on the one hand, and you've got prohibitions on the other hand. The ICRC was instrumental. The International Committee of the Red Cross was instrumental. Uh, for pushing this notion forward. And so you would prohibit outright systems uh, that either directly target humans and systems that cannot operate under meaningful human control. And for all the rest, you would have this obligation in place that says have meaningful human control. For instance, the way I try to describe it by design and in use. So the system is set up in a specific way and then you use it in a specific way. So there's always this traceability back to human agency and the human has a clear idea of when I activate this machine now for the next eight seconds, this is what will happen basically. And so the question by the, uh, by the viewer is, is kind of getting at the heart of this. What does it mean? And my expectation would be, or my expectation would be that a obligation like this at the international level could remain rather vague you could just have this obligation of having meaningful human control and then have domestic implementations of this. And military is actually fantastic at this. You know, They develop rules and tactics, techniques, and procedures that they then apply to satisfy these criteria when operating their weapon systems. But what we should not be expecting is an international regulation that is you know, very finely grained telling everybody what to do, one, when, and one, and when what, and where. This is probably uh, not how it how it can work, uh, but there's a lot of you know discussion still to be had about this. Um, this is what the future hopefully is bringing in in the debate about autonomy and weapon systems. Thank you very much. We are nearing the end of our webinar today. There are a lot of questions still in the queue, and I apologize to all our viewers as we will not be able to address those questions. However, I would like to give the floor to our three speakers for any concluding remarks or comments they would like to make before we close today's session. So I'm going to go in the same order that we started the day with. So Ambassador Hainosi, the floor is yours for any concluding remarks. Well, thank you. I hope uh, that our discussion showed uh, how fascinating uh, this issue is, and it's rather complex. And uh, that means also uh, in the public debate, it's a little bit harder to uh, communicate uh, uh, how dangerous these developments are, uh, uh, because you 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 have to address it uh, from from IHL, from ethical perspective, security. We didn't talk a lot a lot about this because it was not in the title for today. Uh, but uh, I, I mean, uh, it is uh, really. Uh, also from the security uh, perspective, uh, uh, there's a high potential of uh, uh, destabilization, increased threat to, the, to all of us, uh, uh, such, uh, uh, they, uh, such ways could also be used, uh, not only on the military battlefield, strictly speaking, and so on. So, so, so. Uh, there's a wide range of concerns. Uh, uh, in my view, the, perhaps the most important thing is that uh, the discussion on those issues is broadened, that you bring in uh, more groups. And uh, at the GGE laws, it's a rather restricted group of uh, military uh, uh, and, and not uh, those who are really on the battlefield uh, 
uh, these are uh, the rather uh, those who sit just in the in the ministries uh, in certain departments. Uh, uh, you have, of course, diplomats there. There's not a lot of participation from industry. And of course, NGOs are very interested and uh, they, they can contribute, but the structures there are not that they can uh, contribute enough. So, so it's a little bit uh, distorted, uh, uh, the whole setting. And I think uh, we really have to, to, to broaden this uh, uh, and widen uh, also the participation in the uh, debate and uh, nothing uh, can help as much as more public concern about the issue because that's always uh, in a democratic setting the, the driving force and we need, uh, we need uh, clear uh, regulations because if not uh, we are just uh, overwhelmed uh, and surpassed uh, by events and then it is very hard of course to successfully uh, negotiate regulations when certain things are already produced and on the battlefield. Uh, so again, I think the, the, the clock is ticking and uh, the societal uh, impact, uh, I think would be quite far reaching. Uh, and it's really a question whether we would like uh, to see this. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Dr. Sauer? Final remarks. Final remarks. Uh, thank you again for having me. Thanks to the organizers. Um, thanks for the big turnout. I'm very grateful for uh, so many people being interested and for the questions. And it was great to see my fellow panelists again. As the ambassador said, it's all about awareness. And we've created some additional awareness today. So that's great. Thank you. And Laura, over to you. Yeah, um, I, I also just want to thank you uh, for the invite today and for shedding light again on, on this uh, important topic. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you. Um, maybe just quickly on one final note, I may like to elevate our focus a bit because sometimes the debate, especially when we talk about autonomous weapon systems, it gets very focused on specific technologies, which of course I recognize is important, um, but it's also just important to keep in mind But while we talk about this, uh, the red lines we draw now, or the red lines that we do not draw, uh, are likely to impact future legal norms um, around technologies um, that may contain this or have the same um, potential to transform human decision making. So the current debate in Geneva, for example, on autonomous weapon systems represents quite a critical normative juncture in the way we think about human role in warfare regardless of what technology is being used. And I think that's just important to keep in mind before we get very focused on specific technologies. Um, but that's just one quick note I wanted to add uh, from my side. Um, so again, thank you so much for the invitation and um, please reach out to me or my team in CIPRI if you have any questions. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now. For the concluding remarks, I would like to thank all of our speakers today for addressing a very complex topic and being very informative, as well as contributing to public awareness, which is a very important aspect in trying to understand um, artificial intelligence capabilities and how it could possibly be utilized in the military sphere and what can be done about it. So I would like our participants to join me with a virtual round of applause to our speakers for a very informative, very rich discussion today and thank our participants for their active participation and numerous questions. And once again, apologies that we were unable to address all of those questions. Um, as we noted at the start of this webinar, this is part of our deterrence and emerging technology series. So the next session will be held next Wednesday at three o'clock and you can register online at the BCBNP. With that, Thank you again, Dr. Sauer, Laura, and Ambassador Hainosi for your time today and for a very great discussion.